Yo, what's good, Knicks Nation? Welcome back for another Game of the Week preview. Of course, we got to preview Game 2 of the New York Knicks facing the Indiana Pacers. And who better to join me today to preview this game is none other than Scott Agnes. You can, you can find him over at his Substack, Fieldhouse Files, and his podcast as well. This man covers the Indiana Pacers thoroughly so make sure to check out his work too so that way we get come on people we got to be into getting the opposition side as well we got to make sure we get all angles as we're watching this series but before we get into it make sure that thumbs up button for your boys make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so and make sure to support our sponsor underdog fantasy use that promo code kftv to get up to a 100 dollar match okay scott my man how are you doing today how are you feeling i'm doing well good to be on with you a lot a lot of emotions here Felt locally from Indianapolis, obviously, due to officiating and such. I'm not a big officiating conversation type guy, just because <laughs> you can probably feel that out in every game. And game two might be a little bit in favor of the Pacer. You just never know. Now, it was bad, and I'm sure we'll get into it. But um, that's kind of the general feel, I think, from the Pacers side um, going after going into game two here. As a Knicks fan and watching this team for so many years, you know, I understand how – fan bases can feel where you feel like you're just getting robbed by the referee and it's tough, man. Absolutely tough. Especially when, you know, we had earlier this year against the Houston Rockets where it came down to the last seconds and they called a foul on Jalen Brunson. I'm like that. I feel like there's, there's levels to this, but I don't want to get to the whole referee thing right now. We're going to, we're going to talk about the two minute let's report a little it. bit. Let's yep. save it. But let's get your thoughts on game one. All right. Game one. It was a look, this game, <laughs> this series is for as a Knicks fan, it's so much different than watching the Knicks uh, Philadelphia 76ers matchup just because of mm -hmm. the physicality and the defense. This is going to be a true testament to offense. And yesterday did not disappoint. I mean, we had 121 points scored by the New York Knicks, 117 by the Indiana Pacers, very to little defense, but there was just a lot of shot making. And for the Knicks, it came from, you know, the. The usual suspects, Jalen <laughs> Brunson, Dante DiVincenzo, Josh Hart. You knew the Nova Trio was going to get out there. Indiana Pacers, on the other hand, didn't get a good game from Tyrese Halliburton, but you got TJ McConnell, a, a known Nick killer. You know, you also had Miles Turner go out there and do the damn thing. And you also had Pascal Siakam in his bag. What did you think about game one? Yeah, I'll first go with this. If you look at it's it's funny, depending on how you read the box score, you could make different assumptions, I think. You see the score, I'd say Pacers win. You see three-point shooting, Knicks plus one. You see rebounding. You see fast break points, the number one stat probably for the Pacers in this series. I think they lost by two. You know, all right, it was absolutely a Knicks win. And on top of that, I think you see Jalen Brunson had another, another special night where he went off for more than 35, 33 points is what I believe the threshold is. Mm -hmm. Anything above that, I think the opponent's in trouble. And that it proved to be, again, the case in that one. I thought it was a fantastic game up until the very end where, my goodness, how many replays are we going to have to sit through? Three in the final 151, I think it was. Both teams exhausted their challenges. You don't see that very often. It got me almost on the gravy train last night talking about, can we just get rid of replays? Like, is it doing more harm than good almost? Uh, was the tangent I got on a little bit last night uh, after game one. Uh, but as a whole, I thought it was a tremendous game. You saw some counters. You saw some back and forths. But more than anything here, Alex, the prevailing thought in my mind is stars win in the postseason. And what did we see? We saw Jalen Brunson have a fantastic game to lead the way. Yeah, absolutely. Jalen Brunson with his fourth 40-point outing plus mm -hmm. point outing. I mean, he did three in the last three ga three games, four, five, and six against Philly. Then starts off the series against the Indiana Pacers, dropping a 40 burger. 43 burger to be exact. And he was just phenomenal last night, but you know, looking at this game and I agree with you, it's, it comes down to, cause it was a nail biter. This game was tied. You talk about the last two minutes and you're like, Oh, like it, it could have gone. <laughs> it fit either in, it way. was on and brand for the on... Knicks the last few games, right? Where it, Knicks haven't won easily. They have always had these close games. I think it was game five. I thought for sure they'd finish the job and the 76ers hung around. And so Pacers, generally speaking, have either one bad or one big. So they haven't had a lot of these close games. They've only had two overtime games. So this was not a new experience, but a different one. Definitely. Definitely. Like I've, and I watched that buck series and it was definitely like, it's, it's so extreme with the paces, right? It's either they're yeah. clicking on all cylinders, knocking down every single shot or they're not. And that's just kind of what I, I feel like they start off the season on such a high octane offense. And then after that in-season tournament, things started to get a little shaky, 
But to your point, as a Knicks, like from the Knicks perspective, I'm just used to the cardiac Nick affair at this point. I mean, shout mm-hmm. out to CP, you know, founder, CEO of, of Knicks fan TV. He was like, because there was a there was a stretch during the regular season where the Knicks were just winning games comfortably. And he's like, don't you just miss those cardiac Nick affairs? And I'm like, no, I don't miss any of those things. And now it just feels like every single game throughout the entire playoffs, it's like it's going to come down to the last two minutes. And it doesn't even matter if the Knicks are in front. It doesn't matter or if they're behind. It just it will always come down to the last two minutes. And I guess as we're talking about the last two minutes, I guess we can't bury the lead anymore. Let's talk about that two minute report just because. I find it interesting how much controversy there is about the last two minutes. And when you look at it, it was pretty even. There was missed calls on both sides. What was your takeaways from the two-minute report? Yeah, first even remove before I get to that, I think you saw Jalen Brunson just take over. Um, And so I give him a lot of credit as he asserted himself, um, handled his business. He doesn't do that. We're not even talking about any potential last two minute report, but he took over when the Knicks needed him. The Pacers got up five. He knocked down, I think a big three, um, then went to the free throw line for a couple free throws. And I remember tweeting at that point, it was like four minutes left. I go, this is a dangerous time for the Pacers because they allowed for the Knicks to hang around in a series like this. You cannot do that. You got to put away the opponent early or not early, but (laughs) certainly don't want to play with your food out there. Um, you, you just don't want to leave it to chance. Well, the Pacers left it to chance. Jalen Brunson outscored them by himself. What did he have? Like 21 of his 43 he had 21 in the fourth points quarter. In the fourth quarter, yep. Like 16 in the final five minutes. That's a player you want on your team. Man, it's so much fun watching him play. I think he was like 15 of 15 at the free throw line, which is, it's big time, especially given the minutes that he and Josh Hart and so many of them play at this point. And so, all right, now that said, now you get to the last two-minute report. Um, And there was even the one play before that, though, I thought they totally botched, and it was actually a Knicks challenge when Brunson went all over Miles Turner, I think. I forget when it was, maybe the six-minute mark. To me, I mean, I didn't even need a replay. I saw that live. You could see he barreled into Miles' shoulder. um, Mm -hmm. That I thought that was a clear foul on Brunson. I'm not even sure why we're challenging this and wasting all of our time. Um, Then you get to the the true last two-minute report, and the kickball is the main thing. From the Mm -hmm. Pacers, I totally understand their argument. Um, It was a tie game, and it was a clear – even on TV, you could see Neesmith reach down, I think, with his left hand, get a piece of it. It rolled into uh, maybe Tyrese or another pacer, Nemhard's hand, and they were going to go on a fast break. They were going to get it going, and instead, it's Knicks basketball. I think DiVincenzo nails a big three-pointer in a game mm-hmm. where they only made 11, um, and that was the go-ahead three-pointer. And so I think the Pacers certainly have a a gripe in that case. Um, The last two-minute report mentioned a couple littler things, like um, Miles Turner, while uh, he should have been called for an offensive foul on a moving screen with 12 seconds, and then I think a defensive three seconds as well. Um, On the other hand, that moving screen, like, what are we doing here? I agreed with what he had to say post-game, Alex. I'm curious how you feel. But um, that was 45 feet from the basket. Um, it may have not been a perfect screen, but I think it was more of a dive than a perfect screen. And I just wouldn't have called anything and leave it up to the players. I don't think either team would have felt bad about that. How do you feel about all that? Yeah. I mean, in the first round, it's totally different. And, and I guess just for the listeners at home, so they know the last, what the last sure. report says, Miles Turner, illegal screen, good call. Aaron Naismith kicked ball, bad call. Dante DiVincenzo did foul Naismith on the screen, should have been called, uh, turn off. Also should have been called for illegal screen last play of the game. So those are the four calls they they noted. As you see, it's evenly split down the middle. My thing is, and we saw a lot of it in the first series with the Knicks and Sixers, where the last two minutes, they just let the teams play. And they let the players mm-hmm. dictate who should win. And I'm all for that. I'm all for letting, letting the players dictate who should win. And I think, you know, when we get too ticky-tacky at the end, and I don't think it's... I don't think it's necessarily just a knock against Indiana. I thought the way that the rest were calling the game has been reverted back to what they were doing the first half of the regular season, which I thought they were going to change up. And it just seems to be, an, mm-hmm. we just get it more inconsistency as the game, as the season goes on with how are we going to manage these games and how are we going to like affect play calling and, and the players as they keep on, like as they keep the flow of the game going for me, just don't call that. 
Like as much as it's in the Knicks' favor, I'm happy the Knicks had it. It mm -hmm. gets it puts them in position to win. Yeah, I know. Great, I could jump jump for joy and say Yahoo, but I think <laughs> at that at those at those at those instances, you got to let the players dictate it because now we're allowing the referees to really dictate the game, and then you just add all the conspiracy theories. Like, oh, this is hosed. They're they were trying. And to that's get what I can't NBA stand in that like conversation. Yeah, is the I people think, I, and I heard it on my post game show last night, Alex, when I was going live. Like I think you guys do as well. And the majority of comments from Pacer fans are sitting back there saying, "Game is rigged." Of course, they don't want the small market team to win. And there's two of the three officials are from New York. What are we doing? And I do actually kind of agree with that after in hindsight. There probably shouldn't be any team, any officials from that home state. Although I will admit, I think Zach Zarb is the best official in the league. Mm -hmm. He clearly had a couple obvious mistakes late in the game. But going into this game for both teams, I felt good about it with Zach Zarba. And fun as a fact, whole. Zach Zarba for the the Knicks, their record, he's actually, that's the rep that they lose most with. They're three and six. Right. I did not know that. Zarba. So it's it's funny how it just goes to these, oh, well, they're trying to get the Knicks. And it's like, actually, if that's the guy that you want, that's the whole guy you want for the Knicks to lose. He, they don't really win. So it's this is where conspiracy theories, it's fun. It's a lot of good banter back and forth. It's also to like, exhausting. It's like, the, it's, like the Char it's like Charlie from It's Always Sunny, right? You have the string going everywhere. Like, well, you see if we connect the dots over here, 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 <laughs> and here. You know, this is why they want New York or whoever to win. And it's just it's just fascinating. I mean, we've seen small market teams do it. Denver did it. Uh, we saw Milwaukee do it in the past. I, I'm just like, I'm just not a big believer in that. But with regards to just how officiating should go, I'm all for, you know, letting the players dictate the end of the game. I'm also in the in the camp of, you know, if you're gonna be blaming the refs, I also look at did your players execute well enough down the stretch of the game to not put themselves in that position? Like, exactly. When it and came that was down the to message the Pacers were having after the game, and I think that was deliberate. By the way. I think that was deliberate that they would, they wanted to put, they didn't want to use that card, I think, and say, mm -hmm. if this happens again, we're going to come all out against officiating, but we don't need any fines. We don't need to be sounding uh, whiny and crying after a game one. There is so much left in this series. And that even goes back to the Pacers' first round series. Even when they were up, um, they tried to keep themselves level headed and say, Hey, look, we just got to win on the next one. We got to focus on the next one. So I, I did take notice. And that's actually what I'm going to be writing about is how the Pacers are trying to accept all the blame. They had their moment. They did not capitalize. And to the point of the last four minutes, when Jalen Brunson took over, guess who did not Tyrese Halliburton, zero field goal attempts in the fourth quarter, three turnovers in the final three forty three. TJ McConnell was the Pacers' best point guard on the night. He played two minutes in the fourth quarter. So I think there's a lot of blame to go around. Um, and why I, why I don't like the officiating comments in the last two minutes and all that is because it takes us away from the basketball conversation, from Brunson's great show or DiVincenzo's great defense or McConnell having a grand moment at the Mecca. Like, all those are fun storylines. Absolutely. Absolutely. Salute to Knicks Nation. Thank you all for tuning in for another Game of the Week preview. Thank you all for tuning in for another preview of the New York Knicks facing off against the Indiana Pacers in Game 2. We got Scott Agnes. You can catch his material over at Fieldhouse Files. Not only is it a Substack, but he's also got the podcast as well. Make sure to go check that out. Make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFTV to get up to a $100 match. And also, remember, if you, don't, if you can't get into MSG... We got a watch party tomorrow at Sucker Punch for game two. So make sure to go over there and go support not only Knicks Fan TV, but also go support the New York Knicks and the, with all the orange and blue faithful over there. All right, Scott. So we, we we packed up. We understood what happened in game one. Let's let's look at game two now. Let's 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 focus ahead. Mm -hmm. Game two's up. What adjustments are you looking to be made on the Indiana Pacers side? I think the first thing is just the mental adjustment for Halliburton. Um, there's, he's clearly dealing with some kind of physical ailment with that lower back. It's a long story, but it's nothing just this series or just this season. It's something in his life that he's always dealt with, just kind of pain in the lower back, hip area. I almost wonder if maybe his hamstring injury, that's still not 100% in my mind. I think you really need significant time off. And because of his All-NBA qualifications, after coming back for good, he never missed another game. He had a four-game buffer and didn't need that to his credit. But at the same time, that's such a tough injury. And as we all know, those things are connected. So a left hamstring injury might lead to an ankle or it might lead to a hip. Well, if the hip is offset the lower back, again, I could go on and on about that. But um, I think that has led to some changes to, to Tyrese. And maybe mentally, he's not as confident 
And on top of that, DiVincento did a tremendous job. Um, I think how they guarded him um, made things complicated or or um, didn't allow for him to get into his spots. And then with him, his body's limitations, he just didn't have that confidence, perhaps. We don't know for sure. Again, after practice on Tuesday, all he did was repeat what he's done and has become his thing for a guy who's so well-spoken and is has such a bas- high basketball IQ. My one thing I would love to see him change is after the bad moments, which are inevitable when you're playing this many games, is to be specific. And all he comes out, out with, Alex, is just, I got to be better. I got to play better. And that was not just after this game. He's done that several times throughout this season when he had some lows. So I think it starts with Halliburton and his, his physical as much as mental. I'd like to see Neesmith start out on Jalen Brunson. That adds length. Mm-hmm. Pacers are not a good defensive team. Um, Nemhard is Nemhard and Neesmith are really their top two defenders. I think Neesmith, you would add some length, a little bit more size. Nobody's perfect, but again, if you can keep him to about 33 points, I like where you're headed there. Um, but to me, those are the two biggest things. And then I would add to third, and I'd like to see more early and often trapping of Brunson. Again, I'm not losing to Brunson. Mm-hmm. If everybody else goes off with this lack of depth that the Knicks have, I'd clap my hands and, and congratulate them, but I can't let Brunson go off for 40 again. I got I got to stick on Halliburton for a second, just because sure. he only had six points yesterday, two to six from the field, and you talked about his his lackluster fourth quarter performance. Is is there, I guess, what's the confidence in this team if he can't be that guy because he's supposed to be that guy? Look, I know he's a traditional point guard where he's a table setter. He gets everybody else involved first, and then he looks for his own shots. But you know, he's continuously setting everybody else up and barely looking for his own shot. I just don't know how far that can go if your top guy isn't going to be able to compete with the Knicks' top guy, who is Jalen Brunson. Yeah, and we we faced uh, and discussed this similarly last series. I think it was the game one loss where they just looked um, unprepared for the moment. It, mm-hmm. it, you could tell in that first game that they were not ready uh, for that big moment and going and experiencing it for the first time. And again, I think he took basically six shots. Um, and this was this was a conversation we had with him when he was first acquired, the finding the delicate balance of taking over in games versus setting each other up, picking your spots. And I think he was too cautious, too passive, um, too um, unsure of himself is the biggest thing in that game one. So going into game two, I, I'd much rather lose if I'm the Pacers with him chucking 16 shots than going for six shots. He's the he's ninth among nine Pacer players who played in scoring. I think he was like seventh in field goal attempts. TJ McConnell was great. I mean, he attempted like 14 shots. And while you don't mind that, TJ's or excuse me, Tyrese has got to get his own. So you're absolutely right, Alex. If the if Tyrese doesn't play at least average 15 points, I think eight rebounds throughout this postseason, which has not been great. It has not been world beaters, but it's been good enough. And then other players have stepped up. Um, if he's playing at this level, Pacers have no chance in this series. I think from a Knicks perspective, you know, obviously it's going to be maintaining, main, containing Halliburton and making sure that he doesn't go off because. Look, I'm. There's definitely got to be a game where he just finds his rhythm, and it may take a little bit longer than usual. But I, it's still a guy I do not want to give a chance in finding the rhythm, and then everything just starts to explode for how the Indiana Pacer offense can go. So making sure to contain Halliburton is number one priority for the Knicks. I would say the second thing is limiting the three point shooting. It is just. Mm-hmm. I, look, I get Tom Thibodeau plays a drop coverage scheme and we're looking to protect the paint more so than often. And Indiana really is this modern offense where it's threes or layups. And I know for some people, they may get sick of it. That's just how the league is. But Indiana does it at such an effective rate. I mean, they're also getting up a ridiculous amount of shots within a game, which is just miraculous, in, in my opinion. Just the amount of shots they can get up within a single game is just astounding. I mean, the Knicks had 82 shots. Pacers 88 and I know if Hal Burton was feeling the way that he was that thing could have easily gotten up to 100 within a playoff series which would have been insane so making mm-hmm. sure that we can contain that three-point shooting that's the second biggest thing for the Knicks I think the third thing is making sure that TJ McConnell is not getting comfortable because the bench is just mm-hmm. going to be another aspect for this series because as you already noted the Knicks are lacking depth and now with the Mitchell Robinson injury, yeah. which we could bring that up as well, 
where he's now going to be reevaluated in six to eight weeks because he has a stress uh, injury on his ankle that he had surgically repaired. He doesn't need surgery, according to what the beat reporters are saying. But now you lose another guy. Now we're going down to, okay, we're still going to have seven players because pressure is going to be inserted. I wonder if Alec Burks makes uh, an appearance. You know, here on Knicks Fan TV, we have the saying, put him in the trunk because we had a caller say, you know, he was playing so bad. Put him in the trunk. We don't need to see this guy anymore. And Tom Thibodeau listened. That's and harsh. So we, wow. We, yeah, I know. I know. I know. All I right. know. You, you think we're talking about some mafioso type stuff out here. Or opposing saying, player at that, not your own. I know. But this is this is what was happening during the regular season. You know, you can't yeah. be shooting bricks and fans were just too, too tired of it. So maybe yep. he gets to see some action now because you're going to need some offense. So for me, it's got to contain Halliburton. Got to limit the three-point shooting. And then also, we got to make sure that we can just keep up the stay fresh to me and stopping TJ McConnell because I, mm -hmm. look if your bench goes keeps going and McConnell has just found a groove he he's a Nick Keller I, I keep saying that Knicks fans already know about him especially if you've been around the block it's if we got we got to slow down what the Pacers bench is doing because I think it was up until the fourth quarter you know you didn't have a single player record over 30 minutes which was just insane where we have you uh, just look at our starters. OG played 42. Brunson, 44. Josh Hart played the entire game. Dante Every Vincenzo minute. That's incredible. 44. I know. And he's, and this is, it's, as a Knicks fan, you can't complain about minutes at this point. It's all hands on deck, especially where the situation is. But if you're looking at the longevity of wanting to get to the next round, minutes start to pile up. Like exhaustion starts to add up, you know, become a factor. So, for me, it's how do we make how do we keep up with the Pacers bench because you guys had forty six, we only had three, so that means Deuce McBride's got to show up, pressure's got to be solid, and then I guess you know it's it's going to be Jericho Sims that may get some burn, maybe Alec Burks. Like I said, though, that's my. I'm not thing. so sure they don't keep it to seven, Alex. Like why why change it up? I don't I didn't think Mitchell Robinson was that impactful. Played like ten minutes. Um, it did. It was able to spell Hartenstein, which was tremendous. You kind of need that. But Julius, see, Julius Randle being out is huge because of this matchup in particular. The Pacers lack that physicality inside, and he would just do his half his damage inside. I mean, it'd be like twenty three and fifteen, I think. So that is a sizable loss, even more so in this one, and probably also the last one, right, going against Joel Embiid. But I think it's probably more likely than not they just shrink the rotation than to add a guy to the fold who hasn't done too much. Um, I know, and that's like, and that's yeah. the tough part because seven players once again, and <laughs> it's just tough, man. I, I, I can't, I can't even express where it's just a, like it's concern. I love this team for its grittiness, but you had nine players play yesterday for the Indiana Pacers. Mm -hmm. Do you look at the bench as a strength in this matchup? Definitely, just because of the polar opposites. And I think what you saw to set the tone in game one was Rick Carlisle saying, all right, we're going to wear you down. I led my column last night about the war of attrition basically in this series. Which mm -hmm. breaks down first? Is it the depth of the Knicks and they're just gassed and their legs are out with Josh Hart like never missing a minute? Or is the physicality and the, the bruising and, and the hard screens or anything like that, does that catch up with the Pacers? Because they're more of a finesse and style, a three-point, throwing alley-oops to Obi Toppin. That's more their genre here. And so far, um, I think it's really kind of a good mix of both that we saw in the first game. It was a higher scoring than I think the Knicks would like. Mm -hmm. The Knicks had made more threes. They outscored the Pacers in fast break points. And I think an, another key that I would probably add to your list specifically with the Knicks – is have more um, control of the glass. I think it was basically fairly even. They came out a little bit on top, plus one, I think, on offensive boards. I was fully expecting them to, to win the offensive glass like 18-4 to four or mm. something that dominant because the Pacers are one of the worst rebounding teams. And so that's another t reason why the Pacers should feel like they let game one slip away because that metric should have favored the Pacers. For sure. And definitely the offensive rebounding eight to seven. I mean, it was four to 32 in total, but that's the issue with Mitchell Robinson. And, you know, he's playing through an injury. That's why he wasn't so impactful for yesterday's game. Mm -hmm. But if he was healthy, that's a guy who's elite at offensive rebounding. So his loss is going to be immense, but thank God for Josh Hart because that guy is just a rebounding machine. All right. Uh, before I get you, before I get you out of here, Scott, I, I have to ask you outside of Hal Burton, who are you looking to step up on the Pacers? Who else goes to Pascal Siakam Pacers Pascal. and him looking to make a, a 
They'll agree on a contract extension, presumably starting July 1. Again, like Halliburton, if you're going to be the star, if you're a max contract guy, we need to, you to play like it and be more assertive and rise to the moment. I thought he had his way favorably against OG Ananobi in the post and offensively. I didn't think that was one of OG's necessarily best games. I thought he was fine. Um, I thought he would have more of a. I think defensively from the Knicks in total it was just like a. It was a very underwhelming defensive performance from the Knicks. Okay. In, yeah. In For like from my perspective, I thought, and I know from the Indiana side, you could say they let it get away, and I would say, mm-hmm. I could, I could, I could kind of agree with that. Where the Knicks didn't give their A game defensively, this was not their A game. From what we saw in the first round series against Philly, I was like, this is the complete opposite of what I was expecting. Not everyone's crashing the boards. Miles McBride, I mean, this is a guy who was hitting big (laughs) shots, you know, strapping up Tyrese Maxey. And then I'm like, you are letting TJ McConnell come out here and now look like a better version of Tyrese Maxey. What is going on? The thing about it is every team does. I don't get it. He always is going to steal an inbounds pass. They call it here locally the TJ McConnell. (laughs) Um, And yet he's been in the league nine years and it always happens. It's inevitable. Um, I almost wonder, just thinking this out last night, Alex, I was thinking about this. He's taking more mid-range. He takes a lot of those eight-foot jumpers. He tries to fade back a little bit because defenders are sticking their hands up. That's a mid-range shot. Generally, what does the NBA allow? They don't mind mid-range shots. It's keeping you off the three-point line Mm -hmm. and keeping you from layups. And so perhaps that's a reason why the Knicks were a little bit content. Obviously, you don't want him to go off like he did. He was the first pacer in double figures. Like I think his over-under was probably... 10 and a half points. And that's how much um, he outplayed that level. So you want, you want uh, less of a contribution from him, but quite frankly, if he's the Pacers star player, it's probably not a good outlook for the Pacers because they like balanced scoring. That's something they've talked about all season long is they've emphasized six players, seven players in double figures. Um, Maybe they don't have a 25 point score, but they have four or five guys over 18 points. I think it's been a little overplayed, because, again, stars win in the playoffs. Just look around. Anthony Edwards, for example. How much fun yeah. was that in game one and game two, for for example, there? But in this series in partic- particular, maybe you can lean on that depth. You ho- hope to pressure full court, make Brunson and the other guys tired. That's one area in which the Pacers will try to gain an advantage. For sure. And then just to wrap it up, on my end, who I'm looking forward to step up, is Miles McBride. I need I need him to give Brunson that little bit of rest. He did that at least he did some of that in the first round series against the Sixers, and that is just going to be so impactful for Brunson, just so that way he can come off the bench after taking a few minutes off and still be that impactful score. Because once again, I'm looking at it, it's it's to anybody, you know, when you start to when you run a marathon, you get tired, yep. you know, over an extended period of time, and you're asking your body to see if it could maintain that type of intensity. And look, it's the second series. Max, it can go with seven games as we know. Uh, I, I just, we need everybody all hands on deck to do their part. So that way everybody can get a full rest, but I'm looking more so on McBride because Oh, a two, a minus 13. This is just the complete opposite of what he did last round. So I'm looking for McBride to step up, but Scott, and conversely, I- I'm curious how the Pacers guard Brunson differently. I think perhaps you consider starting Neesmith on him, like I mentioned earlier, I think, and not Nimhard. Um, there's some concerns with that, obvious reasons. I want to see them trap earlier on, take the ball out of his hand a little bit. And I think also if you're sitting back and you're the Pacers, you go, all right, his supporting cast was really good too. Josh Hart, phenomenal. DiVincenzo, phenomenal. Can they keep it up? We, I think we know at this point Brunson can. Can they bet on the others stepping up? And I think that's something um, that maybe they would allow in order for it to not be Brunson to to be such a game changer that he was in the fourth quarter. Well, tomorrow will be definitely an interesting matchup to see what unfolds and to see who does step up for the Knicks and what happens for the Indiana Pacers and if Hal Burton will get back into it. But Scott, I appreciate your time and coming on the show and previewing game two with me. Please let the listeners know where they can find you if you got any work that's up and coming we should be on the lookout for. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'll just send people, as you said, to fieldhousefiles.com and the Fieldhouse Files podcast, or if you want to follow along during the game on Twitter, at Scott Agnes. So keep it simple right there. And it was good to join you here tonight, Alex. Thanks. Appreciate you, Scott. And make sure to give Scott a follow. Make sure to check out his work. Like I said, everybody, we got to make sure that we are tapped in from all sides to understand what every perspective is. So make sure to go support Scott while the Knicks are facing the Indiana Pacers. Or if you're just an NBA aficionado like me, 
make sure to keep checking out and see how the rest of all the other teams are doing out throughout the league. But salute to Knicks Nation and every and I, I, look, I know Pacers fans are t- tuning in as well. So salute to all of you for tuning in and checking out this game of the week preview where the New York Knicks and the Indiana Pacers are facing off in game two at Madison Square Garden tomorrow. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFTV to get up to a $100 match. Shout out to KnicksFanTV.com. We got a bunch of great writers over there as well. And make sure if you want to go hang out with the Orange and Blue faithful for tomorrow's game, because you can't get into Madison Square Garden, Sucker Punch, make sure to go over there and go hang out. We'll have Eric L. Beats working the ones and twos. So make sure to go check that out. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We'll catch you later. We out.